uh, slide up about the um, poll. Is this on? I think I'm on. Yes. So welcome everybody in the room and also online. For those who are online, I love to use the chat box. I'm going to ask you people online to just uh, put in where you're calling from, where you're calling in from, so that you can uh, be counted and, and be present. So I am Betsy Cohn. I'm a professor in the School of International Service. I'm also the SIS faculty coordinator for teaching and student learning, and I'm obsessed with ChatGPT. And so we have a big agenda today. As Anna said, we've got this plenary, but it follows, uh, following it, Allison Thomas is doing a workshop on AI and academic integrity. And following that, and I hope you still have stamina, I'm doing a workshop on ChatGPT and the implications for our pedagogy and assignments. And the way I've structured my workshop is, to, is with two breakout rooms, uh, two sessions of breakout rooms so that people have time to integrate and think and process the information from the plenary and from Allison's workshop, because I think a lot of people signed up for all three. So we did try to make this sort of like a mini conference within the CTRL conference here. So to start us off, um, we want to do a survey, which is to ask you what you think about what Betts describes your thinking about generative AI tools right now. And by generative AI tools, what I mean are that those are the artificial intelligence tools that can actually generate text or images or music or videos. That's like ChatGPT, Google Bard, Bing Chat. So if you would, maybe put down your forks. Sorry to interview. I'm terrible about intervening, interfering with food. But if you can do what it says on the screen here, which is go to pollev.com backslash MacCrete558 or use the QR code. And if anyone's having trouble, raise your hand. Raise your hand and someone from CTR will help you with the technology. Don't be shy. And this is uh, forced democracy. Everybody has to vote. And just once. Mac, how are we doing on the, the response rate? I cannot see them because I'm sharing my screen, but I know we've gotten at least like 30 to 40 responses. Can we hear 10 more? It's full. Sometimes they get full if we get over, because we have to use the free version. So we may have over 50 responses. But if you have not been able to respond, feel free to put that in the chat if you're on Zoom and just think about that response if you're in the person. So Mac, would you put the question in the chat box and then people can weigh in with their answer. But all right, so why don't you put the answers up on the board and what do we see? It's not. There we go. Well, interesting. We've got 63% who think students should be allowed, 28% uh, think should not, and 10% are really glad to be here because they haven't thought about it yet. All right. So we uh, might you might want to keep rethinking thinking about that question as we be, uh, carry on through the presentations today. We're going to start with Derek Coburn, who happens to be online, then followed by Iran Carmel, Ariel Bernstein, and Allison Thomas. So let's, uh, I'll in just introduce each person when they're about to speak, which is Derek uh, Coburn, who wears many hats and writes extensively. He's a professor with a joint appointment in SIS and COGOD. He's the executive director of the Institute on Disability and Public Policy, and he's also the faculty co-director of the Internet Governance Lab. We've asked Derek to ask uh, to address three questions. First, to give us a grounding. What is artificial intelligence or AI? How does it work? To really, and asked, we asked him to focus on these large language models or LLMs, such as ChatGPT, to mention some of the common AI tools. And also, Derek works on disability and technology a lot. So we asked him to address how these LLMs might uh, impact his work uh, the, uh, on disability. So Derek, 
Thank you. Very, thank you very much, Betsy. I appreciate that. I'm glad that everybody uh, is here and I'm glad we were able to organize this uh, session. I wish I was there in person, sitting right there between uh, Iran and Allison, but I'm happy to be here uh, virtually. So let's just jump right in and, and answer the question. So the, the term artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. The term was coined in 1955 uh, by John McCarthy, a Stanford uh, professor, and it was the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. Now that has uh, been transformed over time as we have gotten to a more um, uh, integrated, adaptive uh, AI that is closer to what most of us think of as AI and what was envisioned by AI originally. So the US National Artificial Intelligence Act, now the National AI Initiative, calls AI um, a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. And I think that part is really important because it, it the, the National AI Initiative focuses on human-defined objectives. And I think as long as we continue to have human-defined objectives within AI, we will avoid some of the doomsday scenarios that people are worried about with AI coming up with its own objectives and making its own decisions. So those definitions of AI have led to a number of different kinds of applications uh, from autonomous vehicles, uh, self-driving cars are one of the key uh, applications of AI. Uh, there are some decision-making uh, um, applications of AI that are helping in uh, loan applications, uh, job applications, uh, electricity grids, transportation systems, uh, a, a variety of ways. Uh, in search, uh, Bingbot, Googlebot, uh, helping us with search. Uh, you even have AI that is now in Travelocity and those kinds of travel um, applications that are helping you plan your trips. And then we have the generative AI that Betsy alluded to around generating text, uh, images, and sound. So text, things like ChatGPT, uh, Bard, and Bing, uh, and around images and sound, uh, mid-journey, stable diffusion. Uh, there are so many of these apps that are that are out there. Now, how do we get to this idea of... Um, generative AI, which is what we uh, a lot of us want to talk about. So we start from the original artificial intelligence ideas, but we had uh, a new set of developments around machine learning, which we, although we talk about AI primarily, fundamentally the, 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 the foundation of what we know of as AI is machine learning and the ability for machines to be able to learn without being explic explicitly programmed to do that test. They're, they're learning a set of rules and they can apply those rules. Uh, machine learning has two key components, supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Uh, and we can use those two approaches to either take um, uh, deductive approaches where we're trying to explore a large data set or inductive approaches where we're trying to answer specific uh, questions. Now, these techniques are particularly appropriate for text because text is um, uh, uh, amorphous and diffuse and we're trying to understand language. And so these kinds of uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning approaches allow us to uncover all kinds of interesting insights uh, in text. So the next component was deep learning. Um, so deep learning uh, is a layer of artificial intelligence. It's a subset of machine learning. And what it does is it allows us to take uh, the um, approaches that we would take on one particular layer and, and create a neural network that lets us um, uh, maintain a focus on a particular problem as we go through layer after layer after layer. This is what we mean by deep learning. And this is what is giving us uh, these neural networks and allowing us to be able to have uh, much more involved uh, uh, responses. Now, in 2017, this all changed tremendously uh, with um, a Google deep learning model uh, that is, is called BERT, uh, Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformers. So there was a 2017 article called Attention is All You Need, which focused on this idea of a transformer. So when we think about chat GPT, Betsy, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformers. 
So this 2017 model is what has really uh, turned uh, generative AI, particularly around text, uh, uh, on its on its head, uh, and is starting to create these very lifelike responses. So let's take a look at what we mean by generative pre-trained transformers. So um, these pre-trained transformers are able to take large amounts of text that's available um, out on the web. So um, GPT-3, um, so the GPT model, uh, the large language model GPT-3 uh, is what ChatGPT uses uh, now, the, the free version. The paid version of GPT, uh, ChatGPT called GPT Plus is able to use uh, GPT-4. So GPT-3 was trained on 17 gigabytes uh, of data, whereas the GPT-4 is, chain, is trained on um, much larger um, uh, 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 data set of text. So this is coming from all over the web, all of these uh, free sources. Um, it's, it's coming from um, uh, uh, GitHub and all of the um, uh, coding that's available. And it's that large language model that is making these um, uh, uh, chatbots like GPT uh, available. Now, because this is being trained on publicly available text from all over the web, you have the potential for all kinds of biases that are out there on the web to creep into its answers um, that seem so authoritative. So you have um, um, uh, gender-based bias, you have um, age-based bias, disability-based bias, race, ethnicity-based bias, sexual orientation bias, all kinds of potential biases that are creeping into these responses. And that's why there's a focus in, in both the AI Bill of Rights and in the, um, uh, uh, the National AI Initiative to think about building trustworthy AI and how do we think about minimizing the bias uh, in these contexts. So I'll stop there um, and I'm looking forward to our questions uh, later. Thank you, Derek. That's a great orientation for us. I'm sure there's still some questions, but we'll, we'll continue with Iran. Iran Carmel is a professor in the Department of, Informa of Technology and Analytics, and he's been writing about technology for many years. Aaron uh, actually worked, did an assignment with his students last semester using AI, where he specifically asked them to use AI. So we asked him to talk about that uh, experience with his students, sort of why you, uh, Aaron, if you could talk about why you decided to use AI for that assignment and what it actually uh, taught you and your students about the use of AI in general. And the, uh, the humbly, we ask you, what might you change next time to even do it better? Good, good, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, it's good to be here. Um, slide. All right, so I'll open with the uh, homework apocalypse. I think that a lot of our discussion in higher ed is around this image, which by the way, I created uh, using AI, of course. Um, so we, that's us as a teacher and we're surrounded by the evil AI represented by the robots. Next slide. But rather what I submit to you, and this is gonna be the tone of my presentation, that we should embrace and hug and encourage AI. And this was also created by AI. Next slide. Um, last week I was at a computer conference and uh, this uh, pearl of wisdom was shared by uh, two presentations that I was in. And I think it, it's, it's quite a, a nice word of wisdom. AI isn't gonna take your job. Rather, somebody who knows how to use AI will take your job. And uh, this is something that's important for us and important to how we uh, think about our students. Next slide. Um, I've been a professor here at AU for more than 30 years. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of historical perspective um, on uh, disruptions and transformations in educational technology. We've had um, three in my career as a professor. One was uh, the internet in 95. The second is the pandemic where we were thrown into the swimming pool overnight. And you all remember that. I don't have to belabor that. Suddenly we have to teach online. And the third is now. Um, but let me take you back to 95, which is something that most of you don't remember, but I do. I was a young professor here at AU. So the, the internet did a few things that were transformational and disruptive. So one is it, um, 
it uh, made us realize, we professors, that we were not the sage on the stage anymore, but rather that content and knowledge was now fairly diffused. And that, that was a big change. Now, in 95, let me, let me uh, remind you of what happened in 95. Suddenly, the internet was commercialized. Academics used it a little bit before that. I, I started using it in the 1980s, but um, um, it really began to grow very, very quickly uh, as of 95. 95, um, uh, Jeff Bezos opened up Amazon and then came to the dot com and so on. But really, the uh, transformation that happened with the internet and, edu and higher education or education in general was a rather slow one. And let me, let me illustrate that with LMSs, learning management systems, which today we take for granted. It's almost part of the, the landscape, like, like carpeting on the floor. Um, in the late 90s, uh, the very first people here at AU um, began to use, well, we didn't even have a term for it yet, uh, an LMS. Um, Sarah uh, Irvine Belson um, talked um, the, the, the young men at uh, Blackboard into giving us a free copy. And uh, she began using it. And she told me and a few others, we were the very first ones to use an LMS in the late 90s. Okay, look at the date there, 95, late 90s. Uh, Blackboard, which was our first LMS today, of course, we use Canvas, um, wasn't institutionalized here at AU uh, for quite a number of years afterwards. I don't remember when it was officially absorbed in all of our classes, but even, uh, let's say it was 2005. Um, but even after that, um, there were many professors who didn't use uh, the LMS. So, okay, if you, you've got that timeline, 10, 15 years for the internet really to begin to change education. Okay, so where are we now with this uh, inflection point in technology? I think um, clearly um, what happened three years ago is is just remarkable. We were thrown into the swimming pool, right? So where's it gonna be now with AI? Well, my guess as someone who's been around for a long time is it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. I think it's gonna be much faster in terms of its impact on education than what we saw with the internet. Um, and so um, expect that in the coming years. It's it's going to be fast. Next slide. And so what I encourage you to do is to welcome and encourage AI in, in what you do and what the students do and everything they do. Next slide. And treat this year as a transition year. Uh, this is an historical inflection point. There's no question about that. Um, don't fight the AI. Um, so I'm speaking to you, 28% who answered that in the opening. Um, don't use Turnitin. And I say this with enormous credentials. I was one of the very first on this campus to use Turnitin. That's the anti-cheating software. Um, Meg Weeks at SPA um, got a license for uh, Turnitin to catch cheaters. And I was the first one at COGOD to use um, Turnitin. And I, used, I was an advocate for it. I used it for many years. And it was a good tool for its time. We're in a different era now. I, my, this is my personal opinion. I would discourage um, using any of these tools for catching cheating. First of all, there's some technical problems with them and, and so on, but it's really the larger picture. Is AI is changing uh, the landscape. I suggest that you not restrict uh, AI use as much as you can, uh, minimize the language restricting AI use, and um, take it easy with assessments and gradings this year. Um, we have no choice. The world has changed. Next slide. So welcome and encourage AI. And now I want to, next slide. Now I want to give you an example assignment to answer uh, Betsy's question of what I did at the end of the spring semester of 23. Uh, graduate class at COGOT end of, end of semester team project presentations. The presentations are prepared on video. And what I instructed the students towards the end of the semester, given the enormous pace of change that happened with AI, just during that first quarter of um, 23 is that um, is to go whole hog into, into AI in both the content and the presentation. Thank you. Um, so here are qu five quick slides that I showed the students. Number one, I gave them a little bit of perspective on where they are as a historic inflection point. Next slide. Um, I encourage them to use GPT-4, which is better than the chat GPT, which is free. Next. Um, I gave them a list of tools. I especially like 11, uh, which is a voice synthesizer, and I'm going to get to that. Next slide. I encourage them to be funny and creative with AI, and I showed them this slide. Next slide, uh, which you remember, remember from a few months ago. And last slide is the next one. Uh, so what were the results? 
The semester project presentations, remember video, um, not faces, were excellent. Probably the best that I've ever had at, in this graduate class. Now, more content was squeezed into the seven minute allotments that I could do with all the teams that had to present at the end than I ever could because the voices were synthesized from text. So it was very efficient and very crisp. And uh, let me finish this slide. Every word was crisp. This is the unintended consequence of this experiment. Every word was crystal clear and crisp and fully understood by the professor and by the entire audience of the students. And this was very important because my graduate class was two thirds international. Some of them had very heavy accents. It was very difficult for me to understand them. It was very difficult for others. And so all of that issue went away with the synthesized voice. So it, they were very professional pr presentations. Finally, of course, the students were very energized to do this. They understood that they were at a historical inflection point and they were excited to jump into the tools and be very creative with them and learn new things. And I am out of time. Thank you. Just you can finish up here on the presentation. On the, anything else on the, on the project with your students? So uh, Betsy also asked what, what I'm going to do next time. Well, I'm going to double down on all of this, of course, um, and give uh, more structure, more instructions based on what we've learned. The pace of change at the beginning of this, uh, this new technology was uh, just remarkable in the last few uh, months. I could share with you, um, if we go forward, um, just a few slides. Uh, next slide. Next. I, and I'll share all these with you next. Yeah, this is from uh, Forrester Research, which is a technology uh, researcher. We are, we are just novices. We're virgins at using AI right now. And we, as teachers, and we have to help our students as well, be much better at the prompt engineering, the input side, and, and also, of course, teach them on the output side. That you're familiar with. You know that uh, the AI hallucinates and so on. Um, and so we'll learn a lot more in the coming uh, months and in the coming year. This year should be a transition. And last slide, embrace. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're just going quickly through here. So we, we really want to have time for questions and answers. So that's how we've structured this. So I hope you're coming. You're, you're thinking of your questions. So next up is Ariel Bernstein, who is the co-director of, of the MA in Literature, Culture, and Technology here at AU. She's a senior lecturer. She's been teaching classes for more than a decade here at AU in the writing studies, complex problems, and creative writing. So I've asked Ariel to speak about, um, she does this wonderful project with her students, but so it, it's around sort of reflecting on how technology um, has influences their own understanding of information and themselves. So what does teaching innovation look like when it comes to generative AI? Um, do faculty have to incorporate this into the classroom in some way? How could generative AI impact students? What might we see in terms of the affective impact on students? And, and, and if you could talk about how you create space to really engage with students in a, on the topic in a meaningful way and sort of some of the lessons you learn from from doing that with your students. Thank you. You could just go to the next slide. You might need to speak closer to oh. the microphone. Sure. Speaking about technology, this is my first in-person panel since since the start of the pandemic. So I'm getting used to everything. Okay. Um, next slide. Um, so I really want to focus on this idea about joining a conversation with our students and really pushing back against, I've noticed a lot of conversations seem to be positioning this as being somewhat adversarial. We need to stop students from cheating. We need to stop them, prevent them from using this technology. And I think we're at a really exciting point where we can talk a little bit further about, can folks hear me? All right, perfect, yeah. That um, we're at a really exciting point where we can actually have students join these conversations um, and that you don't actually need to necessarily use these tools if you're not feeling comfortable yet in order to start having these conversations. Next slide, please. Um, so I really want to focus on, I think we have the power to help students to navigate the ethical dimensions of AI use in the classroom, acknowledging that many of us probably have um, very different feelings about this. You know, it's affecting not just us at the university, but lots of different industries right now. There's also some tremendous pushback. Um, and rather than base assignments and activities on new tools like ChatGPT, which is one option, I think we can also guide our students so that they understand how a use has these potential benefits and also potential drawbacks. 
Sure, sure. Can can folks hear me now? I can even hear myself now. This is perfect. Um, so long story short, I think that we instead of um instead of using this technology, there's other ways that we can maybe um start to think about how we can have these conversations in the classroom. Next slide. Um, so I like to think of this as a very collaborative framework, which creates an educational space where students are invited to think deeply about the implications of AI usage. Next slide. And so here are just three things that I thought having these conversations up front rather than just having some type of policy. I know that speaking with Allison, there's been a lot of conversations about what's like language I can use in my syllabus that's gonna solve the problem of AI use. And I think instead having these conversations directly is gonna be very helpful regardless of what you're gonna be teaching. Um, we can encourage students to read and understand the current debates about the use of chat GPT in the classroom, also outside of the classroom. We can have students think more deeply about their own writerly process. So I teach writing and literature classes and a lot of the work we do is very process-based. And so talking to students about, okay, so what is your process for writing a particular assignment? Um, you know, we've had tools like Grammarly for many years now, so it's not that all of these things are necessarily new. And so having them think more deeply about Grammarly, citation generators, chat GPT, how does their own process get shaped by the use of these different technological tools? Um, and we can work with students to conduct further research about the implications of those tools. So I know I teach a lot of classes that are directly thinking about the implications of technology today. Um, and so having students understand that these conversations, they might be privy to some conversations and less knowledgeable about others. And so we really have the power to be shaping how students are understanding what experts in the field are talking about today. Next slide. Um, and so again, you don't necessarily have to incorporate the use of AI in your class in order to have these kinds of essential conversations. Um, so for example, in my classes, um, I like to introduce students to texts that illuminate these kinds of nuanced conversations about the impact of new technology. I do a lot of um, focus on speculative fiction and science fiction. So in my classes, we discuss the film Her. You may have remembered that, a film from 2014, where we have a protagonist who falls in love with his technological device. He falls in love with his computer, his OS system. Um, and so we talk a little bit about, okay, so what does the sort of dystopian world look like? Is this an accurate representation? Theo, in the film, the protagonist writes love letters for other people. And so there's an outsourcing of emotion. What do you think about, you know, how does that relate to if you felt like your significant other was outsourcing their love letters? How would you feel about that? Would that be appropriate or not? And then using that as a way to talk a little bit about what about using different kinds of tools in the classroom? What are the ethical kind of responsibilities, the obligations we have? as an individual and as a society. Um, we look at episodes from Black Mirror, and we also look at creative work that integrates and interrogates different kinds of artificial intelligence. And so there's a lot of really innovative work right now that is using these amazing technological tools. And so we talk a little bit about how are these writers actively using this technology for good, and how are they maybe also pushing back and also um, maybe having us question some of the assumptions that we have about whether or not these technologies allow us to truly connect in a human way. You can also demonstrate curiosity about how your students think and feel about tools like ChatGPT. So sometimes we come into the classroom with some assumptions about what our students might be thinking. And I think it's helpful to just have that conversation and say, hey, how are you feeling about this? Um, is there a sense of anxiety right now about the expectations? How can we kind of talk about how this is rapidly changing? Um, do their attitudes shift when exposed to new information? So not just making this one time in the classroom where you're gonna be talking about this, but having this be something that kind of organically comes up over the course of the semester. It's probably not gonna be a one-shot deal. And then I think it's always lovely to discuss your own experience as a writer and thinker and you know, however you're interacting with students. Um, how do you think technology is shaping your own process? I know that you know when I first started at AU, I worked in the writing center. We weren't even allowed to like have a laptop brought into the writing center and today, Obviously, we use laptops. We're using multiple laptops for wonderful effect all the time. And so I think talking about the changes that we've seen can be really instructive for students who don't necessarily have that kind of knowledge. Next slide. Um, and so I really just want to emphasize how regardless of whether or not you choose to incorporate these tools in the class, we can engage in these kinds of ongoing conversations that are helping our students to value the things that we all of us value, regardless of discipline. This idea of close reading, critical thinking, and really being cur and being curious, it's essential in order to be ethical writers and researchers. Thank you, Ariel. Next is Allison Thomas, who 
you may have know as uh, having taught in the Department of Literature and in the American Studies program, she has been bumped up uh, to, well, she has been bumped up and she is our newly appointed uh, Assistant Dean for Academic Integrity at American University in a newly created office. And she's going to address these que this question of, um, so what do faculty and staff need to know about AI and academic integrity and how you've seen students use AI tools in the past year that you've been doing this? And the question everyone wants answered, which is what's AU's policy going to be on this? I know, I know the answer and that was a mean question, go on. <laughs> I think the face I made actually looks like that the robot. I didn't put my own photo there because that conveys uh, that's me and the academic integrity robot. Um, thank you, um, Betsy. Thanks everybody for joining this panel. I learn so much every time these conversations happen. And in contrast to this robot, I would like to position myself as distinctly uh, a, a human who just started in a challenging new role, um, asking for patience and energy and contributions from you to sort of make this next year um, both uh, a, a successful, but a, a recognized sort of work in progress. So thanks in advance for that. Next slide. So um, I, I wanna keep referring to some of the things that others have, have said in, in, in what I'm saying here. Um, Derek mentioned uh, doomsday scenarios. Um, and I feel like the minute, uh, chat GPT mania hit the presses. I was getting emails from faculty, uh, staff and students saying, um, how do I catch cheaters? How do I, is this gonna upend everything that I do? How do I make AI proof assignments? Um, how are you gonna stop this from happening? Um, and, and, and what is AU gonna do to stop the use of artificial intelligence tools? Um, really parsing that out for me has, has sort of been involved sort of considering what some of these tools do. So generative AI is really blanketed, ter blanketing term. Derek kind of alluded to this. There's tools beyond chat GPT that do really specific things. I can tell you, I saw students using lots of them in the spring, tools that summarize uh, tools, that, that was one of the most common ones, tools specifically that write summaries. So a student puts in a link to a source, um, the tool generates a summary of it. Um, uh, tools that create images, tools that design presentations, like this one, I used AI to generate this presentation. Um, that, that robot image just uh, came out like it knew me. Um, uh, tools that generate le lengthy pieces of written work, ChatGPT is only one example. Um, uh, tools that draw from research or create citations. That was probably the second most used thing I saw from students in the spring. Uh, and you probably know, uh, Iran mentioned hallucinations uh, and one of the most common conversations about research in chat GPT, for example, is that these tools often generate fake citations uh, that they look like real citations. They even use the names of real journals, but they're not real. Um, and if students, uh, it, so students submit things um, and they're not real, they don't represent real research. Um, and so in terms of our doomsday moment or the kind of uh, freak out that I've seen sort of from my own introspection and from uh, colleagues is that this seems to represent some really huge challenges for higher education in the context of academic integrity. And that is what is help? What does help look like? What does it mean to get help responsibly? And that's actually a challenge that I was already feeling. And many of us, I think this is this may be true for those of you who do the incredible work of supporting students in uh, their writing and in their research um, and with accommodations they need, um, that, that the help landscape is complicated um, and it's sometimes really confusing for students. Um, but the next two, I think, are the most challenging for educators. That shortcuts and substitutions um, are one of the one of the problems we might encounter with AI use. We use things for shortcuts all the time. We use calculators to shortcut our way through math problems. We use um, we use uh, the Google prediction text to shortcut our way through finding things. Right? Some shortcuts are okay. 
But as educators, we're probably quick to say, well, but some shortcuts are not okay, right? On this math test, I don't want you to use your calculator because I'm testing whether or not you can add numbers, right? And so that really gets at sort of what I think is our, our through way through this, an orientation towards learning outcomes as part of the decision-making about where, how, and, um, and what about uh, artificial intelligence tools are gonna fit into our space, our classrooms, our support centers, our interactions, our, uh, our lives. Um, and so I think that clarity about this is a shortcut that's okay because um, this is not a shortcut that's okay because it substitutes, it, it allows you to sort of offload um, the learning or the skills that I'm hoping that you take away from this course. You're really kind of shortcutting when I really need you to be long cutting. That's how, that's how the learning is gonna happen here. Um, others have mentioned some of the big concerns that I think most students don't have a lot of um, experience thinking about or clarity about. I did, um, I visited with a bunch of students this morning um, who were really engaged on the questions of fairness, equity, and bias that come up when we talk about these tools. Derek mentioned that these are tools that are drawing from massive amounts of data um, uh, that's available on the web. And so if you have a tool that's drawing from that data, it's on some level going to represent something about that data in terms of bias. So one of the most common examples that I've seen, or recent examples from research about this is um, a text to image generation tool where someone asks for uh, an image of children doing science and all the images that are output are boys. Um, do these tools kind of further stereotypes or, um, or biases that are represented in a lot of the data collected over the course of human history. So those kinds of conversations, I'm not an expert in the technologies of that, of those questions, but I do think the ethical questions are ones students really want to engage with. The conversations that I had with students this morning were so amazing. I'm so excited to get students involved in these conversations. Um, next slide. We do have a policy. Um, it's the Academic Integrity Code. It's not gonna change until next year. And so part of this is me saying, please join me. Uh, if you would like to participate in that process, we've done a lot of work to this point. I would like to invite you all into that. There are two pieces of the code that I think are most relevant to the examples that I've seen from irresponsible use of AI tools. One is about the fabrication of data that gets to the fake source question. The other is listed in dishonesty in papers. Um, all materials submitted for a course should be a student's original work. Um, the nugget that I always give to students is that 100% of your work should be, uh, your work should be your own 100% of the time. 100% your work, 100% of the time, unless you've noted otherwise with some kind of acknowledgement. Uh, next slide. But in my next session um, this afternoon, 701, see you there. Um, I'm gonna give you some, uh, as much guidance as I can at this point, as much um, advice as I can and a resource um, where my team has been collecting um, materials that might help build a kind of local policy. I'm using local a little bit colloquially there um, to say um, there's no one size fits all policy here. We have a lot of faculty doing really creative things with these tools, um, but we also need to recognize that um, students need a transparent um, policy or uh, attention to these things in syllabi and assignments and Betsy will kind of go into that a little bit more too. Next slide. Great, I'm done. Thank you so much. Come to our sessions. I really appreciate seeing you all in person. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. So Allison and I have been talking about this all summer. So it's really great to be here and to actually be talking about it. I mean, not that I don't love just talking to you, Allison, but it's also fun to talk with some other. And I want to hear in the questions and answer sort of some of your thoughts and questions. But first, I need to raise some concerns that I have. I'm a little bit more on the mm, caution red red flag side. So there. So I want to. I get a few minutes here. So. I, my concerns, I have some concerns about generative AI like ChatGPT. And we've already heard it can produce, you know, the racist, sexist, anti-Semitic con concepts or content. It makes things up and it hallucinates. It takes people's, we haven't heard it, how it takes people work and uses it without attribution. So there's intellectual property.
concerns that people have. But I have additional concerns. So for the staff in the room, if a machine writes your reports or your emails, or even as I've heard in one case, personnel evaluations, um, what do you think about that? And for the faculty, if, if the machine, if the bot is doing the work of our students interpreting or summarizing a text or developing a thesis statement, writing the first draft of an essay, preparing a presentation, okay, what do we gain, but what do we lose? We gain efficiency, right? ChatGPT can produce an essay in seconds with a little bit of revision to make it what you really want. It takes about five minutes. Um, at, for, a report, uh, for a staff report or an email, it can be done in seconds. Uh, if, we, if we have our students using it, they gain a skill of learning AI, which can be very useful in the workplace. But I think there are costs, and I want to go through some of those costs. So AU's Naomi Barron, who actually used to head up CTRL, is, has a book coming out in September on this topic. And she's a linguist who studies the effects of technology on, on thinking and writing and, and um, reading. And I quote here where she says, AI threatens student writing skills, the value of writing as a process, and the importance of seeing writing as a vehicle for thinking. Because a lot of people write so that they know what they think. So that's my first concern. Do we lose that? Number two, with machines doing the writing, Naomi Barron found that people lose confidence in their own writing and they lose a motivation for writing. Why should I take the effort, make the effort to write something that's gonna take me a day or two days or six weeks? ChatGPT can do it in a minute or two. And Nir Iskovich, he wrote that, uh, quote, and I quote, AI in its current form can alter the way people view themselves. It can de degrade abilities and experience experiences that people consider essential to being human, right? People write to express their huma humanity. People write to talk about the human condition. And we can ask the machine to write about the human condition, but I still think it's different than when a human is doing it. Number three, if AI is doing the writing, I, we lose creativity and the spectrum of ideas that are out there because AI becomes the knowledge creator. So this is my biggest concern. My biggest concern is the concentration of ideas. These companies that are making, and they're big companies, and there's an arms race right now, um, they are training these large language models to generate text based on probabilities and these neural networks as Derek talked about. So if everyone's using ChatGPT, which was initiated, developed by OpenAI, it's owned by OpenAI, initiated by Microsoft, initially funded by Elon Musk, we're possibly moving into this world of a certain narrow set of ideas, which is totally contrary to where we've been going more recently, which is a much wider set of ideas that are being expressed. So it calls, as we've said, it calls from the internet. So there is a wide range of ideas, but it is these trained machines that then put them together in a set of ideas. So it can create an echo chamber and it just reinforces the notion that I see it on the internet or the machine produced it, so it must be true. And Lacey Wooten in College Writing, who I've been talking to all summer about this, um, she's pointed out that there's this homogenization of a writing style. You can see it, though it's sometimes hard to identify. And the writing style is pretty boring. So those writing instructors are concerned about that. Number four, and lastly, my big concern is the impact actually of, of technology on our brains and how we act, right? With the, we know that with the internet, our minds, our brains became rewired. We scan a page rather than lead, read left to right. And it's much less linear thinking, right? Nick, Nicholas Carr wrote about this in The Shallows, about how the inter internet actually affected our brains, the, the neurological ways in which our brains are structured. So the medium, for example, impacts the, and shapes the process of thought. I'm not saying it's all bad, but there's an impact. So with the information, I have a lot more information available. With the internet, I have a lot more information available to me. Since it's always available, I don't know about you, but I don't try and remember anything anymore, right? With my phone, when was the last, I can give you my phone number from when I grew up, 
you know, 50 years ago, but I, you know, I can't tell you my best friend's phone number right now because it's just stored in my phone. Um, GPS with GPS, that's great technology, but how many people no longer know how to read a map? So the technology matters, right? And so Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. So I think we need applied here. We not need. We should focus not necessarily just on the content of what ChatGPT is producing, but rather how the medium AI is changing how we think and changing our behavior. And to remember that technology matters. I don't have a crystal ball, but I want to. I I'm thinking deeply as a pedagogist about how higher education and our broader society is going to look when our the machines are doing the writing and our thinking instead of our students. And I've already seen this. I had a student say to me, why, I, 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 it takes me, it's, it, you know, the machine can just do it so much better. It, it's too hard for me. And, and they just gave up. And I don't want my students to give up. And so I think what it is doing already is taking away this expectation of the importance of struggling with ideas. Now, I don't like to struggle. I want it to be easy, but what happens to our society when we create when we these machines allow us for things to be easy and expecting things to be easy? And will we give up this idea of effort and be left with this concentration of ideas? So am I saying give up on this technology? No. I mean it's here, but I want us to be reflective about what it actually is doing. Uh, to higher education. So that's my bit of a downer. I recognize it. I'm struggling with it. You've um, heard from others. So I would ask maybe now, do I do ask? I'm in the spirit of time, because we have to end on time. We have about 20 minutes. I'm just going to go right into questions. Who's got some questions? They did, like, or comments. We have to, we, you need a mic just for the people online. And I hope that the people online ask some questions. Put them in the chat box and Max, Mac will uh, get them up to us. Hi, hi, I'm Barbara Bernstein. Yes. I'm an adjunct here. Um, <clears throat> you know, this may sound odd, but to some extent, I see this related to the political landscape where people can't agree on what's true or what are what the facts are. And I also see this as somewhat related to the advent of Britannica. In other words, there, what we really want people to do is have a certain base of information that they know facts that they don't have to look up, such as the multiplication tables, um, who George Washington was, et cetera. But beyond that, we've always been able, or it, certainly in the lifetime of any of us, to go to a library and access facts This certainly I understand this takes it to another level, but I'm saying it's really to some extent a continuum of that, a continuation of that process. But ultimately we want them to be able to think and evaluate and logically understand and compare and contrast and so on. I mean, one of the things that one could do is have a couple things AI spit out and say, how do they compare and contrast? What does, did AI miss anything? that I as a teacher mentioned in this class. Here you ask AI, what are the five most important <clears throat> health benefits of dance exercise? I teach dance here. Um, and, and then you can say, were they correct in selecting those five items as the most significant? How would you change this? So I, you know, you can, if you think about ways to get at teaching ch students to think, and accept the fact that for from time immemorial, since we've been alive anyway, there have been access to facts. It, re, understandably, that's really escalated enormously. I don't know, just as, as putting this in perspective. Right, right, right. I think it's a great comment. Do you wanna take any of that? I guess, it, I guess I would just say thanks for bringing up the, um, the possibility of using these tools in that way that's happening. I've talked to a lot of faculty who were using it that way in the spring. A lot of our computer science faculty in CAS have thought about um, having students uh, generate, generate code using um, these tools and then critique the code 
um, what would happen if this code, you know, if we tried to enact this code, it's not going to work. Why is it not going to work? Right. Um, and, and so I think that's a really common way in a lot of faculty have found to sort of test this out a little bit. Should I Allison, can I just uh, respond to that uh, as well briefly? Please. So, so I, I like the example Allison just raised, and I think that having that kind of companion is certainly uh, one way that people are, are using these tools. So, for example, with coding, um, you know, right now a coder uh, is always going to run into problems. And what the coder tends to do is most coders will have uh, Stack Overflow uh, open on their screen, which is a question answering site that you can go to and try to find answers to problems, coding problems that you've run into. And you have to stop your flow and go and sort of find that answer, you know, negotiate through the various answers, you know, maybe try to figure out which one works and then go back and, and try it. So when you're using, um, uh, you know, let's say chat GPT uh, uh, on the side as kind of a, a, a co-pilot, and some of these companies are integrating the paid versions as, as a co-pilot, uh, you can have that open beside you. Uh, go in and answer the problem that you're having or find an answer to the problem that you're having, you know, uh, try that out and keep moving forward. So it allows you to have a more seamless flow on what you're focusing on rather than having to stop that um, and, and uh, go out and find uh, an answer. And I think that's one of the really positive ways of using that as an assistant rather than having it generate the code for you, which is likely not to work. Uh, and Iran, uh, you'll be pleased to hear this, you know, in iTech 200, we're talking about uh, having an assignment this year uh, that encourages the use of ChatGPT for an SQL uh, as as assignment. And there's no way that it can answer the, qu it can generate the SQL query that you need because it, unless you have a very careful prompt engineering, it's not going to generate the right SQL code, but it can generate SQL code and then you can critique that code. Okay, and I'll put a plug in for my workshop on assignments, which is this is exactly, I mean, this is what we're going to be talking about is sort of how, what kind of assignments, and uh, and it always go back, to me, it goes back to the learning outcome. What do you want your students to learn? And uh, the example you gave is really where I think most faculty are. Um, I'm going to save my comments on that till later, as far as some of the concerns, I, issues I that, that raises. I saw a hand in the back. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arthur Stallworth. I work in first year advising. And I first I want to say I really appreciate this panel and everything that y'all brought. It, it, it came from a perspective I wasn't expecting. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. And I have a handful of questions. I'm trying to narrow it down to, <laughs> to one of them. Um, and like one thing I was thinking about in terms of Aaron saying, like, you know, welcome, uh, you know, welcome AI. I always think welcome your robot overlord. So I always talk politely to chat GPT just in case, you know, <laughs> what, what might happen later on. <laughs> but to try to get to one of my questions. So like we, we've kind of danced around it a little bit in terms of how are we going to go about teaching that AI is simply a tool, all right? There's this ideas around it in terms of it's better at doing this. Uh, I can't think this way. Uh, it's better to go about this right, but it is a tool at the end of the day, and it's a tool that's going to just keep coming and coming. So how and like where, right? Is this going to be taught in a writing 101 class? You know, is it going to be taught in a psychology class? Is it only going to be in iTech classes? Where is Where do you think that um, there's an opportunity to be able to learn about AI and that it is a tool and uh, the, the, psychologic, uh, the psychology around it? Well, what, the one thing I'll say, um, Arthur, is faculty have different responses to AI, and some are going to try and ban it. Some are going are so are going to try and use it. So some don't. Some see it as a, an interruption to to learning. Some see it as a tool for learning. And so I, that's one of my concerns: is the students are going to get such mixed messages. So every faculty member, and I will even put this out even to the staff, any supervisors. We, supervisors to staff need to be very clear what's an appropriate or responsible use of AI. And so uh, faculty also need to be very clear in their classrooms what's a responsible use of AI and is it okay for brainstorming? Is it okay for a first draft that you then critique? Is it okay for finding sources in a lit review or not? Because the students are going to have completely conflicting answers to those questions, depending on the course and the faculty. 
and in that, I would say Aaron's point is right, which is we need to be patient and gentle with the, with our students. I was, I was just going to say, I think it's also okay for us to not have all the answers. Um, and I think it's okay for us to be honest with students that this is something which is rapidly changing every single day. And that, um, you know, for me, I think that's why bringing it back to this sort of conversation is that, you know, it's likely, you know, I, in my in my writing classes, I will be talking about this, but it's likely that students are going to be getting lots of different messages. And I think that um, explaining to students these aren't mixed messages because people are trying to confuse you because this is something that as a society we're grappling with. I think it's something they'll really appreciate. Like I, every time I've had a conversation with students about AI, they actually get really excited and they're especially excited to be taken seriously when we ask them about, you know, tell me a little bit about what's it been like for you to have a particular tool in your, what was it like for you to use Tumblr growing up? You know, what did you, how did you connect with people or not? And people will have really amazing um, things to say about that, right? Like these things, um, I think it's a bit of a myth that these tools only have uh, either a positive or a negative. I think there's a, a really big range of reactions. And so I think that'll help to welcome students in the classroom and also show we don't have all the answers, but we're also, we don't need to be afraid. We can have these conversations. We have those tools already teaching an institution like AU. I guess I, I want to, I want to appreciate your question and also recognize the sort of question of mixed messages in terms of like the where's our where's our policy question, which I think is a totally natural thing to want, like the university to have a po a single policy or statement. But I think um, I'm saying there isn't one specifically right now, not because I haven't spent some time trying to draft one, <laughs> but but because there isn't one message. One of the hardest things about this is that it's contextual. And so part of our job is helping students understand that context. And I mentioned that I was with a group of students this morning who said, uh, one person said, I was in a class in the spring and uh, like two thirds of the class handed in a project and they'd all used chat GPT for the project. And the professor kind of had some weird questions about it and realized what was going on. And the professor started engaging on the topic and allowed them to redo the assignment once they the professor sort of realized what was going on. And the student brought this up to me in a way that was kind of like, so this went beyond telling and into teaching. And usually what happens for students is, one of the first questions I ask students is sort of like, where and when did you learn about academic integrity? And I put up a slide of like Stonehenge or something. And, and they'll be like, I mean, I see it on all the syllabi. Yeah, but did you learn from that? No, that's text. I was told that. It didn't, it wasn't taught, it was told. And so that distinction I think is one that's really coming to the surface now in terms of academic integrity. We can't just tell students this. And that's why writing 100 isn't, can't be the only place. It just can't because it's contextual. In your class, it might look different than my class, which might look different for students kind of building a resume at the Career Center, for example, might look different. Putting in information of, of a classmate to do peer review, are you compromising that person's privacy, intellectual property concerns there? Um, Send me more questions if you have them. <laughs> uh, we have a an online participant question. Pat Patricia, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. Hi. How are you? Uh, my name is Patricia. I'm in the Spanish language program, and I actually I wanted to, you know, share some of my experience. I was actually in Spain taking a course, um, you know, a methodologies course in teaching, and obviously because ChatGPT is. Uh, the topic of conversation not only here in U.S. but also abroad. Um, you know, I had the, from, I was kind of hesitant about ChatGPT, as many of us sometimes could be, because we're afraid, especially in language learning when we're teaching Spanish, we're so afraid that this technology is going to be used uh, instead of students actually producing. But it really shed light to me when I participated in this seminar. I wanted to get some feedback because for me, it's very important that whatever it is that I share with my team. And with the students, it's aligned with academic integrity. But I think the approach that they were using was very interesting, which was um, the fact that we could embrace the technology and, for example, give an assignment to students where they're allowed to use it. And then they have to think about the questions they're going to write and what 
that ChatGPT is going to produce and then take a screenshot of what ChatGPT produced and then they have to continue to elaborate and make changes to improve and so as that work uh, that work in progress and then from the uh, critique so I don't know what you think uh, about that that's something that we could potentially do yes <laughs> all right that went well I guess my, my concern is with academic integrity. It's something that we're allowed to, like how do we frame it from the perspective of academic integrity? That's something that kind of, you know, I really wanna make sure that we convey to students and we're that are making sure that we're following the policies. So I think that it's incumbent on every faculty member to have very specific policy in for their courses about what is and is not allowed okay. because this, otherwise, the student might do something and be accused of cheating when they didn't know that it was, you know, that they didn't mean to cheat. Okay. And students, and, and that's, I'm going to talk about this this afternoon in my workshop on assignments. So um, let them know it, they are allowed to use it for this purpose, but not for that purpose. For And there's a man, a professor named Lance Eaton. If uh, you can Google it, he has a Google Doc um, in which he has gathered policy uh, on policies on AI from faculty from all over the place. And he's got about 60 or 70 at this point. One of the resources uh, I'll be sharing is a SharePoint, an academic integrity code SharePoint, where this is really a work in progress, really only for the next year. It's not beautiful, but um, I hope it gives you some resources and some things to chew on right away. Uh, Eaton's Google Doc is on there, along with some syllabus guidelines and ideas. Um, I think to this comment that I see in the chat right now, is centralized academic integrity policy the best way to handle student assessment in this new context? It's, it's sort of part of the comment that I was making that sort of policy, the policies that we have are enough to sustain us for this for this year. We can make decisions together about what changes, if any, sort of need to be made in that regard. Um, but it is something that every syllabus and every context should attend to. Like Betsy was saying, sort of be transparent about what's okay and what's not okay. Being specific to your discipline or your professional space and those expectations. Professional organizations are making comments about this. Um, they're putting out requirements. There are journals that are making statements about this that you can point to for students. Um, citation styles are attending to this. Um, and the SharePoint site also has some resources for citation. Um, I think asking students to acknowledge the kind of resources that they're using might also be a moment for them to say, oh, wait, if I have to acknowledge that I use chat GPT and I don't want to do that, does that <laughs> present any, does that present any concerns? Whereas if I'm okay with acknowledging it and it's been uh, an approved tool, then maybe I'm okay, you know, using a citation to acknowledge it. A colleague, Samantha Bradshaw in SIS last semester, she had her students, she said, you can use ChatGPT, but you need, need to footnote where you used it in your paper and then explain why you needed to use it for that purpose. I like it a lot. Um, uh, thank you to our panelists. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I was thinking about the idea of um, centralized knowledge, since that's like a concern that comes up for us a lot. And I, and I hear a lot of folks expressing, you know, um, not being able to distinguish fact from fiction and things like that. And so the question I would ask in response for us to just consider would be whose knowledge is centralized and whose experiences are considered the centralized knowledge. Um, and often that is a very privileged set of knowledge that's being reinforced by treat being treated as canonical. So for example, what's treated as the canon in grad school is reinforced as the canon when you keep treating it like that. And then it's white authors over and over again, right? So I think something to that I'll ask us to think about then is um, not everyone does have access to the same information um, and, and hasn't, unfortunately, for a long time. And other expressions of knowledge should be embraced as part of it. So if we're thinking about, you know, 
writing assignments? Are there, I know chat GPT can do things other than writing assignments, but why writing? Why are your students writing? If you can, you can translate that to the, you know, you, um, be transparent with them about that. That will definitely help. Cause if they're like, why am I writing? Of course they would use an AI to produce that. Um, and then we want our students to question what is fact and fiction itself? And this idea, I think of, you know, just one sort of set of facts is very Western and privileged in its own way and reinforces types of white supremacy. So something to consider there would be, we want our students to be critical thinkers who ask like, is that a fact or is that not a fact? And can there be multiple truths at the same time? That's a much more intersectional way to think. And that's the kind of critical skills we want our students to develop. Yeah, this will probably be my only statement here. Um, uh, so uh, I'll I'll say this a little bit provocatively on purpose. Um, we our goal here as teachers and here at this university is for students to learn, and that's what we should focus in on in the next few years uh, in this new landscape of AI. Too much of this discussion, with all due respect to Allison, um, uh, is on grading and assessment and cheating and. Uh, we we have to change our assignments for some of us, for some of you, dramatically. Um, it's going to go into your comfort zone, perhaps, but we have no choice, and uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I want to echo that, um, that we're an education institute, and to go to author's point about training, when I signed up and I really called CTR, are we going to have anything on AI because I want to learn? Um, and I've spent all summer on YouTube trying to learn as much as I can on how the different tools. Um, and when we ask the question, um, what is an appropriate use of AI? How can we begin to answer that if we don't know how to use the tool? And so I really hope that we can have training. Um, what are the different uh, AI writing assistant tools? Um, how do we use it to up our game in teaching and up, in ga up our game in terms of generating ideas and working with ideas? And, and so that's what I hope we'll be doing is getting more training on how to use it as a tool. I think that's a tall, it's a tall order because first of all, the technology is constantly changing. What is chat GPT, chat GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-10, wherever we are, right? And then that might be replaced by, uh, you know, something else tomorrow. And there's so many different versions, like uh, on the SharePoint that I mentioned, I have like little carousels that show you some examples coming from uh, students that I've seen using these tools. So there's four or five that are like summary tools I saw students use. There's image generator tools that I saw students use. And so I don't know how to use them all. And it may not be, I mean, we could probably think about like some workshops later in the semester that focus on some of the most commonly used ones or the biggest ones, but there's also the kind of like how, how usefully spent sort of is that time if we're not, maybe the bigger question is something like um what kind of tools are okay to use to get help in this course based on our learning outcomes if my course is a graphic design course and i'm using powerpoint to generate my slides have i done something in conflict with the learning outcomes there and the answer is probably yeah the learning outcomes are probably inviting you to learn how to use the design tools how to build a sort of uh, rhetorical message using uh, visualized graphics and things like that. And so if I'm using a tool to offload that. And so I think those bigger questions are what's gonna help us the most. Um, and then playing with some of the tools that we know students might be likeliest to use. I don't know if others have. So unfortunately we're out of time and there's another set of workshops, but, uh, and what is your name? Rhonda? Rhonda. Um, you raise an excellent point. I'm going to throw it to CTRL to say that they're going to organize a workshop or uh, uh, for faculty and staff on how to use these AI tools. Maybe Laron and Derek could be the ones who are sort of being, I'm just, you're being voluntold, all right? So uh, I would encourage people to think about coming to the next session on Allison's about academic integrity and some of those issues. 
but, and then my session, which is, we're going to go, I'm going to, if God willing, uh, we're going to, I'm going to break people up into, uh, breakout rooms based on the kind of assignment that you might have in your course or staff. I'll have a separate one for staff, separate ones for staff. And then think through the issues about, as Aaron says, how do we revise our um, this assignment in the face of AI? And even and then, so what do we need to communicate with our students, as Ariel says? So thank you all for coming. Good luck with the beginning of the semester. And I hope, um, yeah, good luck with the beginning of the semester. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Bye -bye. so much, Bill.